you can, please give him a standing ovation. We have John W. Parfield. Good morning. My name is John Barfield, you know that. And I want to tell you how pleased I am to be here today and to share my story with you. I think it's a good story because it started from scratch. And that's where a lot of entrepreneurs start from. So I'm delighted to be here. And I look forward to sharing a few experiences with you. Well, again, I'm very pleased to be here today. And I'm glad that I have this opportunity to share a few of my experiences with you. I always like to uh, start my remarks by mentioning my wife, Betty. Uh, I met my wife when she was uh, 11 years old. Uh, and uh, I had just moved to Michigan, and I thought she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, when she was 17, we were married. And now we've been together for 73 years. <laughs> My wife is not well, or she would have been here with me this morning. So I ask you to remember her in your prayers uh, when you pray tonight, and that uh, her health will improve. Uh, it's been 73 years, but I almost did not marry her uh, because uh, her mother didn't like me. and. Uh, I don't know whether you, any of you gentlemen in here have ever had that experience, but uh, I saw this very beautiful girl, and I used to walk her back and forth to school, and I always walked her home and carried her books. And I would see her mother sitting on a porch, and I'd say, good morning, Mrs. Walls, how are you today? And she said, I'm fine. <laughs> and I could tell by the tone of her voice that she didn't like me very much. But uh, I was determined to use all of my skills and charms to win her over. So uh, I kept walking, and one day I was driving her to work, and uh, that was the day my wife was 17, and she, we decided that was the day I'd ask Mrs. Walls if I could marry her daughter. So we got halfway between Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, and I said, Mrs. Walls, and she said, what? <laughs> and I said, could I please marry your daughter? And she said, God, no. Well, anyway, I stopped the car, and she said, why are you stopping? I say, so you can get out and walk the rest of the way to work. <laughs> she looked at me, and a big smile came across her face, and she gave me permission to marry her daughter. And, uh, and as, our, as our fortunes improved, I used to I always embarrass my uh, mother-in-law by saying, Mom, why didn't you like me? And she said, I did like you. And I said, no, you didn't like me at all. The only reason you allowed me to marry your daughter was because you didn't want to walk to work that day. <laughs> But I love my grandmother and my wife as mother, and she loved me. And uh, it, was a, it was a joy for me to spoil her. She was very old-fashioned. She had raised four girl, children uh, alone, and, and she was uh, a wonderful lady and very old-fashioned. So I taught her how to drive my golf cart and how to hit golf balls. And I taught her how to drive my boat. I remember one day we were on Lake St. Clair, and I had a 36-foot carver, and we were going down the lake, and I said to Betty, let's have some fun with Mom. So I said, Mom, sit in the captain's chair, and this is a throttle, and when you want to go fast, you push it down. When you want to go slow, you pull it back. So she said, there, oh, Johnny, I can never drive this boat. I said, Mom, you can drive it. She sat there, and she pushed the throttle down. The boat leaned forward. She pushed it a little farther, and before we were full throttle, and her hair was flowing, and tears were coming out of her eyes. It was just fun to, to spoil her. I bought her her first swimming suit. Oh, God, Johnny, I couldn't wear that in public. Mom, with legs like those, you could wear a bikini. Get out of here. It was just a joy to spoil her. And when my mother-in-law was dying, my wife and I were sitting by our bed, and she was staring at me. And I said, Mom, why are you staring at me? And she said, because, Johnny, no one has ever had a better son-in-law. There. Okay. <laughs> You know, I appreciate the opportunity to join you for Tycon Midwest, Midwest 216. I'm honored to share the stage with such outstanding uh, group of entrepreneurs and other distinguished guests. I've attended countless conferences and spoke before a wide variety of audiences in my 89 years. But I can say with all honesty that 
the people I enjoy interacting most with are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are interesting people. They believe that the best way to do everything is yet to be discovered, and they believe they're capable of making those discoveries. And without them, the world as we know it would not be as it is today. Last year, I was published to, uh, I was uh, privileged to publish my, my autobiography, and I give all of the money that is from the sale of those books to the Rotary International to help eliminate the scourge of polio. So when you buy my books, uh, $15 of the price goes to Rotary, and the Bill and Melinda Gates will match it with a two-for-one, so every book that is sold provides $45 to help eliminate the polio from the world. So I hope you'll buy the book. Um, I want to tell you a story that happened to me 85 years ago when I was four years old. I lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama with, with, my, with my family. And one day I became deathly ill. We didn't know what the problem was. Um, but I, I could not get out of the bed. I could hardly see. And uh, this particular day, everyone was around the bed crying and praying and doing whatever they could to help me to recover. And nothing they did brought me any relief. And out of nowhere, two ladies came to our house. Uh, they were white ladies, and that was unusual because we lived in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which was one of the most racially divided cities in the world. And those folks came to my house. Uh, they walked into the front door of the house and up to the house and uh, walked in the house without, without knocking. And they walked up to the bed and looked down at me, and they saw me, and uh, they said to my mother and my father, you have a very sick baby here. And one of the ladies took out a pencil piece of paper, and she wrote an address on the paper, and she gave it to my father and said, run as quickly as you can to this house and give this to the person that's living there. Uh, my father ran to the house and knocked on the door. And when he got there, he found uh, an old man sitting in the house the old man invited him in. My father gave him the note. The man got up and packed his motorcycle and drove as quickly as he could to my house. And when he got to my house, he walked up to the bed and he said to my mother and father, I want you to make me a pot of strong black coffee. They did that. The man sat down by my bed. And uh, later, uh, that, that uh, sit down beside my bed, and the next morning, my fever was cured, and I found myself out in the backyard playing with the other children. Uh, I asked my father who this man was, and he said, you know, we don't know who these women were or who these men were. He said, we came to the conclusion that these were people that God had sent to spare your life. And he said, Johnny, maybe God has a work for you to do. I came to realize that whenever God gives a person a gift, he will teach that person how to use it. My teaching came from a remarkable man by the name of Robert Burt Lutton. Mr. Lutton had a small store on Hallam Avenue in Washington, Pennsylvania, where my family moved after leaving Alabama when I was four years old. My father believed that he would do better as a coal miner in the North rather than in the segregated South. However, we found that racial discrimination in, Alabama, in Pennsylvania was just as bad as it was in Alabama. Uh, a series of accidents and other misfortunes had forced him to close his business, this Mr. Lutton. But he had worked as an entrepreneur. And when I met Mr. Lutton, he had, was packaging small uh, boxes of soap, and he was selling these boxes of soap. And I had a, 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 route, a newspaper route, and Mr. Lutton was one of the customers on my route. And I found him to be a very interesting person because he was the only man that I'd ever met in my life that went to work every day wearing a white shirt and a necktie. My father went to the coal mines every day 
in dirty clothes and sweaty clothes. He would come home in the uh, evenings from work. My mother would have a buckets of water on the stove. My father would sit in the, a tub in the middle of the kitchen floor and take his bath. And quite often, when he, before he finished his meal, my father would uh, <clears throat> come to the table to eat his, eat his meal, eat his meal, and sometimes he would be so exhausted that he would fall asleep while he was eating his meal. Mr. Lutton was not that kind of a person. Mr. Lutton was a businessman, and he went to work every day wearing a shirt and a necktie. And I could not understand why some people had to work so hard for a living and other people didn't have to work hard at all. So on my paper route, I would stop and talk to Mr. Lutton. And he taught me many things. And I decided at that early age that someday when I grew up, I was not going to be a coal miner. I was not going to be a sharecropper in the cotton fields of the South. I was going to be an entrepreneur. I was going to have a business of my own. I was going to go to my office every day wearing a white shirt and a necktie like Mr. Lutt. And so, uh, again, <clears throat> it was unusual that Bert Lutton, a white man in his 50s, and I, a black boy of nine years old, developed such a strong friendship. I delivered Mr. Lutton's papers to him every day, and I would ask him many questions. Mr. Lutton had come from a well-to-do family. His brother-in-law owned and operated a large dairy farm, and Mr. Ludden had once been the sheriff of Washington County. He had been very successful as an entrepreneur. At one time, he owned an amusement park. And I would always end my paper route at his office. And I did that so that I could talk to him. And he answered many questions for me, and he taught me much of, of what I needed to know to become an entrepreneur. And one day I said to him, Mr. Ludden, can I work for you and quit my paper route? And he would always say to me, Johnny, do you think you could do what I'm doing? And I say, yes, sir. And so I began to work for Mr. Lutton. I learned at the age of nine to package his soap. I learned to clean his shop. And I learned all of the other things that I needed to do. And then one day I said to him, Mr. Lutton, could I sell your soap as well? And he said, Johnny, do you think you could sell my soap? And I said, yes, sir, I think that I could. So every day after school, I would load my paper bag with his soap, and I'd go out to the wealthiest parts of Washington, Pennsylvania, and I would deliver my, my soap to the, to, the, to the houses, and I would ask the people in those houses. I'd say to them, my name is Johnny Barfield. I sell clean and lean soap. Would you please buy some from me? And they would see this little raggedy boy on their porch with a paper bag full of soap, and they would say to me sometimes, little boy, how many do you have? And I said, I've got 15 left, or I've got 21 left. And often they would say, well, why don't I buy all of those? I could put them on the shelf and use them later. I knew they were doing this because they knew that I needed the money. But I didn't know it at the time, but Mr. Lutton was teaching me to become an entrepreneur. And so I said that when I grow up, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, We moved to Pennsylvania, and it was there that I made a pretty big mistake. Okay, okay. I stopped uh, school in the 10th grade, joined the U.S. Army, and went abroad. And I came back from the Army with no skills and took a job at the University of Michigan as a custodian, and I worked there for the next six years. It was then that I decided that I would leave the university and start a business in my own. That was the beginning of our first corporation. Three minutes? Yes, sir. OK. And uh, the, the, uh, the story goes on to talk about what we did later on in life and about the uh, companies that we've started since. My wife and I have started nine companies uh, in our years of marriage. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, uh, the last company started, Bartech, has become one of the foremost countries of its kind in the world. Thank you.